It's good to be here with all of you again tonight. We'd like to open to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 this evening. You can picture a, a man, and he's uh, sitting, you know how people sit sometimes at, at stop signs or traffic lights, and, and they, they hold up signs, you know, need work or need food or something. There's a man who was sitting at a, a traffic light, and he's holding up a, a, a need food, he's hungry sign, and, and this is the kind of person, you know, sometimes you wonder why are they there, but this person clearly just didn't have any way of taking care of himself. That was very obvious to everyone who could see him. And across the street there was a McDonald's. And so there were three different individuals that day who saw him while they were sitting in line at the McDonald's. And each of them ordered something extra and, and took it, you know, across the street. When they got to the stoplight, they rolled down their window and they gave it to him. And, and uh, you know, the first one it, it was there at breakfast time. And so he saw him and he ordered a, an, an Egg Mac muffin, right? You know, that's the, the hamburger for breakfast. And, and so he got him one of those. And he took it across the street and rolled down his window and he handed it to him. And his reason for doing it was just really because he cared, because he, he, he wanted to help. There was someone who clearly couldn't provide food for himself and he said, I can do that for him and so I'm going to help him. At lunchtime, a different person rolled through that drive through and he saw him over there and he ordered him a hamburger and on, you know, in addition to his own hamburger and he rolled down the window and handed it to him. But his reason for doing it was more out of obligation you know he maybe felt a sense of guilt or just that i i should do this i i uh you know do i want to i don't know but i, I feel like it's the right thing to do i just should do it and so he hands it to him and he rolls along the third person comes by at dinner time and he at dinner time he needs more food so he gets the hamburger and the french fries you know he gets the whole meal and he takes it across the street and he rolls down his window and he hands it to him and uh and but his reason for doing it was really uh, because his mother-in-law was in the car with him, and he thought, this will give me some brownie points with her, you know, if, uh, if she sees me giving some, some poor person some food, she's going to like me better. And so, you know, each, each person really did the same thing, the same action. They bought some food, and they gave it to someone who could not give food to themselves. And if, if you maybe worked across the street, maybe you worked at that McDonald's or, or somewhere nearby, and all day long you had seen this happening, and you had seen each of those people roll up, and then when you went home that evening, you stopped and you rolled down the window and you said, excuse me, I have a question for you. And he looks up and you say, those three people, did, did all three of them help you today? The homeless man would have said, well, yes, they all, they all gave me some food to eat. I can't get food for myself. Did all, did all three of those people offer you something of value, offer you something that, uh, that, that benefited you? And, and what was the difference between them? And other than maybe what they ordered, he, there's really no difference. To, to him, there's no difference in what they did. They, they gave him food. He was helped by all three of them. But in Matthew chapter 6 and verses 1 through 4, Jesus yeah. describes that to God, there really was a big difference in what all three of those people did. That God saw a distinction between each of those people um, in this illustration. And that while the man was helped, and that's, that's to understand Matthew 6, 1 through 4, you have to understand that Jesus was taking for granted that the Bible tells us to help people, and that, that he is just assuming that his, his audience knows this. He's assuming that we understand, that we should help people. And, you know, you think, you know, back to the time, the law of Moses, the instructions to, uh, to when you harvest your field, to leave the edges, so that the poor people had something to get to eat without, you know, they had to work for it a little bit, but they, they couldn't afford it in any other way. To help the poor. You think Job in the Old Testament. Job talks repeatedly about how righteousness, a part of righteousness, is helping those who don't have as much, who can't afford to get what they need. And, and even Paul in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 10, in Galatians 2.10, he says, The only thing Peter ever told me was to be sure to help the poor. And he said, that was exactly the thing I was most eager to do. Throughout the Bible, it is just a, a, an understood and given fact that we are to help people. And so in Matthew chapter 6, 1 through 4, Jesus is not talking about whether or not a person was helped or not. That's a given. All the people who helped someone in Matthew 6, 1 through 4, they did help someone. The question that Jesus is asking is, why? Notice Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1. He says, Take heed, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men, to be seen by them. 
Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, that your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. His point really is, it's this section is not about the person being helped. They are helped no matter what is happening here. His point is about the person doing the helping. And the person doing the helping, it matters why they are helping. It matters why they are lifting up others. Now remember, this is uh, in the center of the Sermon of the Mount. And so back in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1, we are told that Jesus ascended up onto a mountaintop so that he could preach a sermon that taught people how to be blessed. And that's the first 12 verses. Blessed is he, and blessed is he, and blessed is he who does this or that. And blessed literally is the idea of someone who feels transcended, as if they are lifted up above life's problems, as if they are, are seeing things from heaven's perspective. And he says, if you are in my kingdom, then even when you go through life's most difficult and terrible problems, you will be blessed. You'll feel as if you were not in them, because you'll see them from heaven's perspective. And he says that righteousness is an essential quality of the blessed people. You remember Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, he says, I say to you, unless your righteousness, that's doing what is right by God and by others. Righteousness, doing what is right by God and by others. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means, there is no other path for them to enter the kingdom of heaven, literally the kingdom of the skies, the kingdom that's transcended, that's high up and out of life's problems. And that, so these Pharisees, whom he later would call hypocrites, you know, they on the outside they look righteous. But Jesus says the inside matters too. It's not just about looking righteous, it's about being righteous. And so he follows that with, you know, the, his several, um, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And, and each one of those is, those who look righteous say this, but I say to you that if you just want to look righteous, that's all you have to do. But if you want more than that, if you want your insides to be righteous, it's going to be more than, than just what they're telling you. In chapter 6, in chapter 6 and verse 1, he starts off, and this is the first time that he, he doesn't use the phrase, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. And so he's sort of moving into a new section, but it really carries the same idea. He's still going to be talking about how the Pharisees and scribes, how the hypocrites, how those who look righteous are doing things, and how it doesn't match those who are blessed, those who are a part of his kingdom, who are transcended above life's problems. And so as he starts out, the first thing he says is, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. And this is, this is kind of interesting because he's had mostly commands, the commands that he's been giving them have been about their actions, about, you know, not to look after someone, to lust after them, to go the extra mile, things that they do with their, their hands and their feet, with their bodies, with their eyes. But here, he gives them a command, and the command has nothing to do with their actions. Really, he says, their action is correct. Their action is what he's calling charitable deeds, and that's the idea. The idea of charitable deeds is the idea of seeing someone in a situation where they cannot get out of that bad situation on their own, and out of the compassion and pity that you feel for them, doing something to help them get out of it. And so, you know, you think most often, and it seems that he's most referring here to financial things, but really that could be, that could include a lot of things. It's not just financial, it could be physical. Someone who is ill, like Jesus did, he would help people who were ill to overcome. You know, someone someone uh, who's in a wheelchair falls out of their wheelchair, you help, they can't get back, you help. You know, you see they're in a situation they can't get out of and you help them. It could be spiritual. You think Galatians chapter 6, and in Galatians chapter 6 and verses 1 through 2, he says that if you help someone, if you... Uh, uh, I forget how he says it exactly, but if you uh, help someone who is lost in their transgressions, who's strayed in transgression, 
that, uh, that you know, you're, you're helping them to bear their burden. And sometimes spiritually, we get into to difficult places and we need someone to point it out to us. We need someone to help bear that spiritual burden. We need someone to show us the light and to get out of that darkness. And so really, it could be any kind of help where you see someone who's in a position that they can't get out of on their own, and you think, I want to help them, and I'm going to help lift them up out of that. I think one of the most vivid examples of this, if you remember Jeremiah, when they threw him into the pit, and it says he sunk into the mire, right? a deep pit that they would have filled with rainwater, but it's not the rainy season, and so there's really just mud left at the bottom, and there's no physical way for him to get out of that pit. There's no rope or ladder. He can't climb out of it. You ever try to climb a mud wall, right? You just slide right back down it. And he's stuck down in it. And then there's Ebed Melech, the, the servant of the king, who sees him in his terrible situation. And he says, he will never get out of that on his own. But I can do something about it. And he gets approval from the king. And they have to find a bunch of linen and tear it all up and tie it all together to throw it down there and hoist him out of it. He becomes so weak. But Jeremiah was in a pit he couldn't get out of. Ebed Melech had compassion to pull him out. That, that is a charitable deed. That's what Jesus is talking about in verse 1 when he says, when you do your charitable deeds. And notice Jesus talks about it, like we said, as a giving. This is an understood expectation. He assumes that these people know to follow God is to be people who help those who are in need, to do charitable deeds. And so the question is not, did they help someone? Yes, the scribes and Pharisees were in fact helping people sometimes with their, with their needs that they had. The question is, why? And so the command is not about what you do, the command is about motivation. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before, uh, before men to be seen by them. Now, that doesn't mean that you can do nothing good in front of other people, right? That's just not practical, is it, you know? Is it good to lead prayers before the congregation? Is it good to lead singing before the congregation? Those are good things to do. Can you do those in a way that nobody can see you do it? Right? That, that's not, uh, not really very practical, you know. I'm leading singing, you know. That's not very practical, is it? Sometimes people are going to see you do good things. It's not about whether people see you or not, but if it's why you're doing it. If you're doing it so that other people will see you, right? This is the guy who did it because his mother-in-law was with him. If she wasn't there, he wouldn't have bought the extra hamburger, you know? And so if, if, uh, if you're doing it so people can see you, that's what Jesus is stressing here. And he says the result, why is it uh, that we don't, the reason why he gives this command is otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. And they... They want the reward, clearly. It says God, God offers us a great reward. God has offered us many things. And I think he's talking about something specific here, but, but just generally, God, God offers us many rewards and blessings. He has offered us, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, every spiritual blessing that is found in Christ. And when we do good things, we become eligible, in a sense, as those who are members of the body of Christ, those who are in the kingdom of heaven, to receiving that reward from him. And that's, why, that's why I think he's talking about something specific, of course, because uh, you know, salvation doesn't come because we do good things. Salvation becomes be, because we submit to God. And so uh, this reward is, is not even just something generic. It's something that we receive because we're doing good things. But he says that, that while God offers that to us, we can miss it because we're doing good things but we're doing them for the wrong reasons. Why we do them matters. Yeah, I think, remember, uh, remember Esau? And he was offered an inheritance from his father, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the double portion, the inheritance. And he's offered, you know, this, this life after his father is gone that his father will provide for him. And he trades it for a bowl of soup. His reward was inheritance from Isaac. And he picks instead. Yeah, it was like, it's not even like Texas chili or anything, you know, it's just it's just like basic soup. It's it's uh, you know, I, I can almost see trading it for a good bowl of chili, but that's not even what he's trading it for. He's just trading it for some soup. And his his inheritance or soup, you know, if if someone says, uh, I will give you a candy bar, 
if you'll vacuum all the floor in here. Sharon, Sharon doesn't want to vacuum one day. She'll give you a candy bar if you'll vacuum all the floor in here. And you're like, yeah, I might like a candy bar, you know? Some of y'all think what's going on here. And so, uh, and then someone else walks in and says, you know, I will also reward you if you vacuum the floors in here. But the reward will be, I will make you my inheritor. I'll put you in my will. You'll get everything. This guy's super wealthy. He's got, you know, you'll be, you will not have to work a day in your life. And I'm on my deathbed, so it's going to be tomorrow, you know, and, and you think, was it candy bar? Or that everything will be provided from here, you know, wh which one do I really want? And unless you're just really little, you're not going to pick the candy bar, right? He says, you, you have to pick, you can't have both. And Sharon's like, here's this candy bar, you know. No, 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 you're going to go for this, and that's a candy bar, a bowl of soup. All that God is offering, the reward that God gives us. When we do things to be seen by men, we're picking the bowl of soup. We're picking the candy bar. We do get a reward in a sense, but it's not a good, it's not the great reward that God wants to give us. And so he says, why we do it matters. And he clarifies as he goes into verse 2 that why we do it matters, and so therefore how we do it matters. In particular, I think verse 2 is the how not, how to not do it. He says in verse 2, he says, Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. And so you, you can kind of picture someone wants to, to, to give something to the poor. And in, in Jerusalem, the poor lined some of the streets. I mean, they were just up and down it. People who couldn't walk. We see this in Jesus' day. You know, people who couldn't walk people who had been lame from birth, people who had leprosy and therefore weren't allowed to work for their food, people, you know, all kinds of people would line the streets. And their, their health care system was very different than ours, and their welfare system was very different than ours. And so this was the accepted and understood practice. It's Sometimes when we see people like this on the streets today, we have kind of an idea about them, but that's not how they felt about it. They felt differently than we did. They expected the people to be there. And this, is, this was the understood way that poor people got money if they could not work. And so someone might say, you know, well, I, I'm going to go give to those poor people. And so he finds some friends and he gives them all some trumpets and he puts on his best clothes and his biggest hat and he starts walking down the street and he's got someone in front of him saying, you know, I proclaim that, that so-and-so is giving money to the poor and then he throws it out to this person, he throws it out to that person and there's trumpets behind them and everyone starts looking and watching and, you know, we kind of have something like that today that I think we can identify with. You know sometimes how politicians or companies, they, they'll put out their, their press releases about the good things that they've done? And that's when we work, Sarah and I used to work in newspapers. And, uh, and you can, if you want to put something in a newspaper, you have two ways to do it. You can purchase an advertisement, and that's a more guaranteed way. You know, you're paying money, they're going to do it. Or you can submit a press release. And the idea of a press release is, I don't want to pay to put it in the newspaper, so I try to make it sound as interesting as I can. So the newspaper wants to write it about it themselves, and they'll interview me about it, or, or put a little report together based on my information. And so then my information gets in the newspaper, but I didn't have to pay for it. And so this is what companies and politicians do. They'll, they'll give money to a charity, or they'll give money to, or you know, they'll, they'll help somebody in some way, and then they'll submit a press release, hoping that the newspaper says, well, that's really nice. Let's put that on the front page, and everyone will know about it, you know? And that's, that's um, I don't think Jesus is really directly commenting on politicians and businesses. But that's an example, because, you know, you see those little things on the TV or in the newspaper about companies that sort of fanfare their good deeds, and you think, you know, that's really nice that they did that. But it also feels a little cringy, doesn't it? Because you think, well... They really just did it so that I'll go spend more money with their business. Do they care about people or do they care about me spending money at their business? Which one do they care about? You know, you kind of know. You kind of know that there are ulterior motives over there, that they really just want to, to make more money, to profit in some way. He says that's what these people did. They just wanted praise. And it's interesting that last sentence he says in verse 2, Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Literally, what that says is, Literally, he says, I say to you, they are holding at arm's length the true reward. God wants to give them a reward. But when we do things so that other people will praise us, we are holding it, we are shoving it away from ourselves. 
that reward is not good enough for me. I would rather have this temporary reward. I'd rather have my bowl of soup. I'd rather have this short-term fleeting reward. That, you know, people can say nice things about you. Sometimes people say nice things about me and I think, you don't know me as well as you think you do. <laughs> people can say nice things about you and it can feel good in a moment, but it doesn't really mean that that's who you really are. It doesn't mean that that's true about you. People can say good things about the, the charitable deeds that you do and it'll feel good for a moment, but then a moment later they're saying something good to someone else. And so you have to do another charitable deed to get that same kind of attention. It's not truly satisfying. It doesn't truly fill you. And it, it's uh, certainly, he says, you're holding at arm's length the, the reward that the Father wants to give you. And so this is how not to do it. But then verses 3 and 4, he tells us that how to do it and how you do it matters. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And it talks about right hand and left hand. And in the Bible, when you see right hand and left hand, that, that meant something to them in particular. When you talk about right hand, that to ancient people, your right hand was what they thought of as the useful hand. It's the hand that, that helps you out. It's the one you trust. And that's why... That's where the phrase right-hand man comes from. You know, someone that you could put your life in their hand and they would do anything for you. That's why Jesus is said to be at the right hand of the... You know, you think the Father doesn't actually have hands. Why would Jesus not be at the left hand? Why is he at the right hand of the Father? Because people thought of the right hand as... They understand when you say he's at the right hand of the Father, he is, he's, he's helping, he's useful, he's important to God and important to us. And so he says, your right hand is doing something good and not to let your left hand know about it. Now, he's not saying, you know, uh, someone needs a couch, so you, you have a couch that you want to get rid of. They can't afford a couch themselves, so you're going to take the couch to their house, you know, tie your left hand behind your back and carry that couch in with one hand. And, you know, he's, your left hand is the hand that they thought of as, <laughs> as less useful, you know, and that's, most people are right-handed. And so for those people who are right-handed, the left hand is a little more awkward. It doesn't do as well as the right hand does. Some people are ambidextrous. That's great. He's not saying anything about whether you're right-handed or left hand, but just a general truth that your left hand is just a little more awkward. It doesn't work as well. And so he's saying the right hand is doing something. That's you. You're helping somebody. What is the left hand? Well, it could be the person who can't do for themselves. It could, it could be the person who is in need. It could be the person who can't lift themselves out of that situation, out of that pit. And so he's saying, in essence, sometimes the right thing to do is to help somebody in a way that they don't even know where it came from. They don't even know that you're the one that provided it. Or it could be, you know, you think someone who's nearby, who's not involved with helping them, and, and there's really no reason to know about it. You know, that's a, uh, a lot of times couples help people together. But then you might have a situation where you're by yourself and you help somebody and you go home and then you brag to your wife about this great thing that you did today. And, well, she wasn't a part of it. Does she really need to know the good that you did? Are you doing it so that your wife is impressed with you, so your husband is glad about that? Well, then you have your reward and you're holding God's reward at arm's length. Now, I don't think this means particularly that you can never tell anyone anything good that you've ever done, right? That, that would be a little too literal. He's using figurative language here, right hand and left hand. It doesn't mean there are occasions when it would be good to tell people the good things that you've done. And you see this in the scriptures. Paul, sometimes, when he writes to people, he's trying to encourage them. And so he will talk about good things that he has done, but it's not because he's looking for their praise. It's because he's looking to build them up. And so you may find situations in which you know that if you tell someone, well, I did this or that, that would encourage them, would build them up. To not tell them would actually discourage them, and you would do a disservice, you know, and that's... But again, his point comes down to motivation. Why are you saying this? Sometimes, if Paul, when he's talking about his good deeds, he's defending himself. Someone, a false teacher or something, I think First Thessalonians is one of those examples. There's these people coming in, and they're trying to say that Paul was just doing it for the money. 
And so he writes back and he reminds them, I didn't even take any money, you know. And, and, uh, but that he tells them about all, all these good things that he's done. He tells in Corinthians all these things that he's been through and good things that he's done. Because there are people who doubt his uh, apostleship. There are people who are doubting the gospel because they're doubting Paul. And so he has to defend his own character in order to defend the gospel. And so he tells us about the good things he does. And he even sometimes says things that kind of sound like, I feel a little awkward about saying this, but I've got to do it because your faith in the gospel is more important than me hiding all of my good deeds. Now, there are other occasions when people uh, are, are berating Paul, and he does not tell them all his good deeds. He just kind of takes it. In those occasions, the gospel is not at risk. But when the gospel is at risk, or when someone is doubting, when someone's faith is at risk, that may be an occasion in which you need to defend through a, a, the telling of your own good deeds in order to, to preserve that. But again, it's about motivation. That's for the gospel. That's not for the praise of men. And so he's not saying here that you can never tell anyone anything good that you've ever done. He's saying why you tell them matters. Why you did it matters. And why you tell someone that you did it matters. And that probably most of the time, you could go without saying it. And the people around you would not know what you have done. And that, to a degree, that, that can feel kind of disappointing. You know, I've done this thing, and I just want to tell somebody, you know. I'm kind of excited that I did this. But he says, even though they don't know about it, your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is doing. He says in verse 4, your charitable deed, it's in secret. Your father sees in secret. He knows what you've done. We talk a lot about God sees everything. And in particular, I think we tend to emphasize that he sees our secret sins. We emphasize how he sees the things that we do that nobody else knows about, and that we can't get away from, from, we can't get away with secret things just because nobody but God knows about it, because he does know about it. And that's true, but God doesn't just see the secret things that we do that are evil. God sees the things that we do that are good that nobody ever knows about. He sees the little things that we do throughout the day to help our families or to help those who are around us that nobody else may ever recognize or thank us for. God sees those things. And, you know, if he sees our sins in private and, you know, does what it takes to be just about that, don't you think he even more sees the good that we do and rejoices and blesses us because of that? And that's really the point that he follows with, that your father, he will see himself in secret, but will himself reward you openly. Now, openly, the word there is, is uh, literally... He will shine a light. He, he will manifest. He, he, will, uh, he will reveal not so much what you did that was good necessarily. He's not saying he's going to make sure everyone knows that you did something good. The reward will be revealed by, by choosing your motivation to be to please God. I see someone in need. I want to help them because I care about what God thinks. Because I care about doing things God's way. Because, as Jesus says, I love the Lord, the God, with all my heart and soul and mind and strength. And like that, I then love my neighbor as myself. I do things so that God sees and is pleased. And you know, you think, you're excited to tell somebody, tell God about it. You can pray to God about the good things you do. He already knows, you know, and he's, he's pleased that you've done right. He's pleased that you've helped. God is in his very nature someone who helps those who cannot help themselves. God is in his very nature someone who takes those who are in the worst of conditions and lifts the humble up to a higher place and sets them on solid ground. That's what he's done for every one of us because of our sins. And it's not just sins. He does it in physical ways too sometimes. But that is who God is. And God is pleased when we do things like he does things. He's pleased when we imitate him, when we, when we follow in his footsteps and, and help others, as, as we see Jesus do over and over and over again in the Bible. And so we can tell him about that, and we can know that the reward that he offers us, he will, he will give that to us when our motivations are correct, and we're doing it for the right reason. To summarize, I think, I think you could think of it this way. You know, when we help people... There's really two ways that we can do it. And either way, people are getting helped. It's not about whether people are being helped or not. They are. Either way, they are. But only one of the ways are really, truly right in God's eyes concerning the person who does the helping. Either I can do it to please myself, and that's what verses 1 and 2 describes, if you're doing it so that 
<clears throat> men praise you. You're not doing it to help them. You're not doing it to please God. You're doing it because it feels good, doesn't it, for someone to praise you? And it does. That's why the Bible describes in Matthew 25 that on that last day, judgment day, God will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. God built <clears throat> us to desire praise. God built us to, to be motivated by praise. God built us to long for praise. And we can long for praise that's temporary and really ultimately only please ourselves. Or verses 3 through 4, we can long for praise that is eternal and please God instead. And those around us may not have any idea what we've done, but it's really, in that sense, more meaningful because it wasn't done for self, it was done for God and for neighbor. And I think, I think that can be difficult, <laughs> but I think that Jesus shows us that path forward and that he blesses us in our efforts to strive to build that kind of motivation into our lives. And so if we can help you do that, if we can strengthen you or pray for you, if you find that, that you love the praise of man, more than you love the praise of God, and you don't know quite how to change that motivation, we want to help you, and we ask that you come forward as we stand and as we sing. 356. <clears throat>